Blessings everyone, and welcome to Stellar Maze. This is part 2 to my previous video, in which I spoke about Slavic women's headwear. In this one, let's talk about the men's headwear. Once again, what you put on your head mattered a lot in traditional Slavic cultures. Hats did not only keep the head warm, but also were a sign of status. You may say, Pasenki i shapka, a common phrase which in translation means the hat fits the head. Back in the day, hats would be allowed to be worn everywhere, even in council meetings or events such as weddings. Wearing a hat was like wearing your honor, if you will. If somebody threw your hat off of your head, then know that you have been deeply offended. And if you throw your own hat down, that means you're ready to fight till death. To break your hat meant taking off your hat to show respect for a superior. Oftentimes in old paintings, if there is a Tsar depicted, people of lower classes would be drawn symbolically without their hats. Just like with the woman in the previous video, Slavic men would change their headwear in accordance to a life stage. Children would not wear any hats until the age of 8. At age 15, which is considered ready to marry, boys would start wearing their bachelor hats. A popular one, the kartus, is a type of cap usually with a brim, indicating that this male is searching for a mate, I mean, looking for a life companion. If he managed to get a girlfriend, it will be common for her to attach a flower or a bow to the cartoons. If they become engaged, she may step up her game by adding bands, beads and more flowers. And on the wedding day, the cartoons would be wrapped around with a ritualistic towel called a plat, usually sporting symbols of fertility and prosperity. After all this hard work of decorating, the hat would be replaced by a new one. Once the boys get married, they switch their headwear to a simpler, less decorated one. A guy could still wear some tassels and bands, but only until the birth of his first child. That is gotta be serious, you know. Now the focus would be not on how bright and flashy the hat is, but on the quality of the material. In fact, in many regions, the hat would be named after its material. For example, Plisova for velvet, Mehova for fur, and Puhova for down feathers. Grishnivik is so named because its texture looks like grechka, I mean buckwheat. Straw hats are also very common, especially during summer, and have become a part of the national costume of Belarus. One of the most iconic designs is called a kalpak. It's basically a pointed conical cap, usually with a fur trimming around the base. This design dominated the medieval Slavic headwear and lasted until the 17th century. Different variations of it were worn by the peasants and the nobility alike. The Manamah hat was worn by the Slavic monarchy and is in essence also a type of kolpak. The story goes that Vladimir Manamah, who reigned over the Kievan Rus in the 12th century, received a golden to be taken for a gift. In order to make it look more Slavic, he added a fur trimming around the base. The resulting Manomai hat went on to serve as a crown of Slavic monarchy until the 17th century. Since the 17th century, Slavic headwear became more influenced by European designs. Mormolka became the most popular one. It was a high hat with a flat crown, which is a fancy way of saying it looked like a cylinder and had a fur cuff around its base. This would be fastened with loops or buttons and decorated with feathers, pearls and beads. Mormolka was a hat specifically for the upper class. Another hat made specifically for the upper class was a beast named Garlotne Shapka, or throaty hat in English. This giant monstrosity was a tall cylinder with an expanding top, and was at least a cubit in length. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> this hat can get tiring to wear, so what the people did is carry it with them in their left arm. It was not so much a headpiece as it was a symbol of status. It was reserved only for the bayars, the nobility of the time, and forbidden to the lower classes. Not that they could afford it. The throaty hat is called so because it's made out of the tender hides on the animal's throats. The animal of choice would include martens, sables, and foxes, all the most lucrative. Women would also get their version of the throaty hat, which was called 
Stalbonets, meaning pillar. These were shorter and did not expand towards the top as much. Underneath the throaty hat, the Russian boyars would commonly wear a kalpak, and underneath the kalpak, a small skull cap known as a tafia. Now that's a matryoshka. Now, in conclusion of the Slavs, I'd like to mention two more iconic hats Papacha and Dushanka. Starting with the first one. Papachas were, and still are, a very masculine hat. It was a common headwear of Central Asia, as well as the Kazakhs. When it comes to the Kazakhs gear, there are two most important parts. The Shashka, a type of saber, and the Papacha. A common saying is, if your head is still intact, there must be a Papacha on it. And if you have no one to talk to, talk to your hat. Or talk to me in the comment section, I'm here to listen. Not particularly flashy, the papaha had a very simple and solid design. A tall wool hat. It was usually grey or brown, rarely white, and never a vibrant color. Black ones would be worn in times of war or in the military. The primary focus was the quality of the wool, the highest quality belonging to the karakul. There is a type of sheep called the karakul, which by the way is the oldest known species of domesticated sheep, but the karakul hat probably means black oasis, which comes from the region in Uzbekistan. What I said in the introduction applies to this hat. Papahas are deeply connected to honor, and throwing them off was not good. Sometimes Kazakhs would take off their hat in order to end blood feuds, and in Caucasus it was once passed into law that throwing off another man's hat was illegal. Papahas were made in such a way that it was hard to lean or bow without it falling off. So in a way, this hat teaches you how to stand straight and proud. With this in mind, imagine what it felt like when after the revolution of 1917, the communists banned this headwear, replacing it with a bedyonovka. That must have been a very big oof. After years of protest, this hat would be returned to its rightful place on the Kazakh's head in 1936. Now, let's get to the Ushanka. Perhaps one of the most iconic Slavic hats, Ushanka for the Russians, is almost like the cowboy hat for the Americans. They both looked cool, protect from the elements, and were both brought over from other cultures. Ushanka has an incredibly long history. It originated from the ancient Malachai of the nomadic people, Mongolians in particular. Malachai was a hat designed for cold, windy places. It had flaps on the back in order to protect the neck, and usually two more flaps on the sides to protect the ears. This design got brought over to the Slavs, who called it a triuch, meaning three ears. The Russian triuch would evolve slightly in this design and allow for the ear flaps to be pulled up when not needed, or let down and tied under the chin during harsh weather. This hat was particularly popular among the seafarers, and probably inspired another head called a sebak. This one had long ears extending to the waist, and which can be tied around the neck as a scarf. Sebak was popular among the finno urgic people of what is now northern Russia. Another member of the Ushanka family tree is a Budyonovka, that same head that clashed with the Papahas. Budyonovka was designed for the communist soldiers, and its designer claimed to take inspiration from Yerihonka, the helmet of the Bakhtiers, the heroes of Russian folklore. Now back to Ushanka. In 1919, Russia was divided between the communist Red Army and the royalist White Army. The White Army picked up an early prototype of Ushanka and made it part of their military headwear. This would be called Kolchakovka, in honor of General Alexander Kolchak. And in the 1930s, it was taken by the Red Army and worn proudly by the communists. The end of part one of this video. I'll give you a second to get your snacks, hit the bathroom, or put a like on this video, and comment Alright, already? Let's take a brief look at the Tubiteika of the Tatars, and finish it off with a senescence at the end. Tubiteika was not worn only by the Tatars, and was a staple headwear throughout much of Central Asia, and still is. It is basically a skullcap and won such popularity due to its simplicity and practicality. Nowadays, Tubitakas come in a variety of shapes and colors, with types for men and women. They can function as a standalone hat, 
or covered under a turban. From the Chost region in Uzbekistan, which is a hotspot of Tibetakus, comes the most iconic type, sometimes called a dupi. It comes in a squared shape and has a black base color. Embroidered over it are four peppers, which are symbols of purity and detachment from the earthly things. Or four flowers, symbolizing health and well-being. Why are there four of them, you may ask? Facing the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, these symbols are supposed to protect the wearer's head from all sides. On the sides of the Jupiteka would commonly be arch designs, 16 of them. These represent a strong family, prosperity, and children, 16 of them. And with that, let's move on to the realm of fiction and see what the senescent men are wearing. The casual, everyday hat of a senescent man is a palasyaha. This is a tall, slightly conical hat with a wide brim around the base. The name palasyaha means striped or banded. This refers to a stripe or band that is wrapped around the hat to show social status. In the case of higher status, the band would be woven into the hat itself. There are six different bands for six social ranks, each having its own name. The lowest ranking would wear a pachovka, which means soil. This is the thinnest of the bunch and would be worn by the peasants or the serfs that have a master. Next comes the palyovka, meaning field. This one's worn by free men that farm their own lands. Ricinka, meaning river, is worn by the merchants, although they do not always travel by river. Oftentimes, they'd further decorate their hat with shells, pearls, beads, and feathers, as well as have the band woven into their hat, rather than wrapped around as a separate piece of fabric. Next up, Palminka, meaning hill, is also woven into the hat and belongs to the wealthy landowners that have their own servants. In times of war, they could serve as war commanders, in which case an additional black band would be wrapped around their hat. Above the wealthy is a chief, who has Harinka, meaning mountain. And at last, the priests would have Nibinka, meaning sky. This band would be white, woven onto a red, sometimes yellow hat. It would be appropriate for the priest to have additional swirls embroidered through their gear, representing the sun's power. And that's it. Make sure to put a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe for future content. You may also be interested in following me on Instagram. Concerning the next video, I'll leave the realm of clothing for a bit and touch on geography. Geography of Eastern Slavs, to be specific. And how it affected local history and cultures. And with that, have a charming day and see you in the next Subota.